the title of this panel talk discussion. I'm sorry. Switch these spots while you're, while you're talking to, to be on the camera. <laughs> so the title of this session is Anatomy of an Activation. And it got added sort of late into the program because when Nepal happened, we lost a number of speakers who it was time for them to go do what they do full time and start doing that. So um, we want this to be as much of a discussion as a presentation. So I'm Blake Gerardo, by the way. This is Mary O'Hare, and this is Russ Daphner, our chairman and voting members at HOT. We have Aditya with us, and he's uh, activation coordinator. And I think those are the people that are habitually participating. But everybody's participating, so you can introduce yourselves when you, when you feel comfortable. Um, HOT activates. When we have, when an incident or a crisis arises, HOT has a concept of an activation. And when an activation is declared, it means certain things happen. And so I don't want to step on um, Mari or Russ's planning for this because I wasn't very well involved in the planning, but I'm hoping that this session will give you a little bit of insight into what goes on behind the scenes, how we think about things as we're trying to run an activation, and how we think about things when we're trying to close down an activation. So how many people here have an idea of what it means, what a hot activation means? All right, anybody want to tell me what they think a hot activation means? It's an organizational decision to spend a, a certain amount of attention and effort onto a, a specific call. Okay, and anybody else want to tell me what they think a hot activation means? Come on, please. <laughs> There's no wrong answer, I'll, I'll let you know right now. Anybody else? Nobody else. Great. Okay, you, I'm sorry. Uh, you probably start assigning leadership roles to uh, different individuals to keep track of different Matters of interest. Uh huh. Related to that yep, that's a good And you were going to share? Nothing like crazy. Yeah, Nothing like crazy. <laughs> this is more a question. Does it just mean having a project on the hot, um, on the on the tasking manager, or? Yeah. Well, we'll find out. Okay. okay. That's it. No, it doesn't just mean that. Or I guess I actually meant like, can you have a hot? Project on the tasking manager without an activation. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah, okay. Absolutely. Don't you? Yeah. Don't you? That's that's it. Yeah. <laughs> I was never quite sure whether yeah. or not. Yeah. No, no, no. Uh, the tasking that manager constituted an activation or not. Yeah. No, no. The, the tasking manager is for anything that's humanitarian, uh -huh. mapping related. We're glad to have people use the tasking manager if they find it as a valuable resource. So yeah, that's absolutely right. It doesn't just mean what's on the tasking manager's activation. Anybody else? What they think a hot activation means? Yeah, I think it's like a, uh, an acknowledgement that we are all actively working on that. Like this is the high priority at this moment. Uh -huh. and, yeah, so the group can all uh, put their eyes on one thing. Yeah. So you have to like, communicate it like to the, like, like the Red Cross or the organizations, like, yeah. like Twitter, uh, all those things, and then and then you want like data to like coordinate the, the exports and. Uh, all these, uh, like, uh, and all these things. Yeah. Maybe that we are dedicated to achieve certain <laughs> results. Yeah, yeah. I think every single one of these things is exactly what an activation is, and exactly is not the right <laughs> word, because, yes? I just would like to add that there may be multiple activation activations at the same time, not only one. Correct, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so I mean, an activation is, is all of the things that you just heard. It's all of those things. It's leadership roles, it's using the resources that we have, like the tasking manager. It means immediately start coordinating with other agencies and the people who use the, the data products that we come up with. Um, it means some other things too, which you'll hear about. I see Mikel walked in, who's also part of this presentation. <laughs> so so I, I just wanted to get a sense of you know, where everybody was with it, so that what we present is filling in some of the blanks for the people who don't know anything about it, and the people who said that they, the things that they thought it was, you were all exactly right. You were all exactly right. Everything that got mentioned was part of it. And, and it's part of an activation to understand that some things are not part of an activation. You know, that's, that's, that's part of it too, and it's kind of managing a lot of those things. And so, 
I'm glad you're here, and I'm going to turn it over to Russell and Mari. Sure, so actually I don't have notes to read to you. I actually brought this up here so, so I can take notes. If anybody gives me really good suggestions, that's it. Sorry, I should probably use this. We've had a lot of you, I put so as I introduced myself yesterday, I, I just recently got the contract to develop our activation curriculum. So we've really done this pretty ad hoc so far, and we're really trying to, to button it up and, and, and make it more of a thorough process that has some official steps. Uh, just a, a little background for the Nepal response. You know, I was sitting on IRC, and I, I think the activation happened because Harry Wood got on there and typed, should we activate? And Pierre Valand responded, yes. And that was <laughs> the process for how we activated for Nepal. Um, one of the big things, uh, a couple of years ago, we set up an activation working group that sort of started this process of, of creating a protocol for how we activate. And a big thing that came out of that is we don't want to create any barriers with this curriculum. You know, the, the whole crowdsource, open source thing where we just kind of get together and, and do it. We want to keep that same sort of mentality. We don't want to set up any sort of uh, roadblocks to starting an activation. That's, that's not what I'm uh, attempting to do with a curriculum and a process. But we do want to sort of create a curriculum so that people know that if they want to become coordinators, if they want to uh, be the one that creates an activation for their local disaster or whatever, because a lot of these little disaster, you know, something like the earthquake gets picked up by almost everybody real quickly, whereas there's a lot of uh, crises that happen behind the scenes that really nobody hear, hears about. So we also want to make it so that there's an opportunity for locals to, to come out and say, hey, there's a, a crisis happening in, in my area and nobody's doing anything about it, so how do I do something about it. How do I motivate the crowd to help my, my local community? So I think having a curriculum that we can we can start identifying things that they should know and, and maybe create some, some self-paced training uh, for like building tasks on the tasking manager. Uh, a lot of this, uh, just this week, uh, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, we did a sprint to just kind of brain dump all these things that we kind of do behind the scenes that aren't documented, and then it'll be my job over the next four months or so to put that into something uh, that actually can be useful to uh, a, a larger majority of the community. So, question? Well, I, I wanted to comment from the perspective of a CDC employee who um, feels like um, OpenStreetMap and HOT um, has uh, uh, can contribute greatly to public health crises, um, but more generally just public health work. I think having a clear definition of what an activation is is important because I can't currently articulate that. I, and and I, I've been a, a hot volunteer for three years, but, but, but I couldn't tell you exactly what the process of activating looks like and what resources are leveraged. Well, I can't either. <laughs> Not completely. Um, Things like I don't know, some years ago there was like the um, revolution in Egypt and there was like, like things going on in Libya and some of these are more like, okay, they're more political or whatever, like, I don't know, there are different types of things and earthquakes that, like, I don't know, we should be more careful about or maybe we don't want to, but like, I don't know, like that's, that's uh, more like, yeah, we're, I, we're a tricky part, but like we're, 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 we're you know, like petitioning on the side, like yes or no, or like I don't know. Well, and, and there's some crises that, or, or that maybe un unofficially, like people can be like doing something, but like I don't know. I mean, if, if I can just say, yeah, I mean, I mean, Russ is exactly right. That's what we're in the process of doing. We're we when we say activation, you know, the short answer is. It's dedicated, dedication of resources, and it's a commitment from us that we're going to be working on this project or, or this issue immediately, right now, and doing, working with other people who need stuff, like the CDC and stuff like that, to figure out what their needs are and how HOT can start to meet those needs. And it means that you'll have an activation coordinator, at least one activation coordinator, 
that you know that that's the person who's in charge and that's the person that you can go to. Preferably three activation coordinators would be nice, co-coordinating, so that at any given point in time, in a 24-hour cycle, there's somebody that you can go to and get an authoritative answer on and whatever the question is. There's somebody that you can pass a need to and that person will make sure that need gets communicated. So a lot of activities are behind what that means, but it's a dedication on HOT's part that we're going to be working on this and dedicating resources and time to it and organizing, working with the people who are on the ground involved in this crisis, whatever it is. Now, there's a lot of specifics, there's a lot of stuff that goes on on our end that we need to better define and need to start to decide what that means. Because I think Mikhail brought this up earlier in the, in the plenary talk, as HOT gets more valuable to humanitarian organizations that are responding, we have to get more professional and we also have to start getting, I don't know what the right word for it is, but we also have to start getting a little bit more support to understand that if we're gonna be able to dedicate resources, we have to have resources that we can dedicate. So it's kind of gonna be a kind of a growing process for HOT and for all of the people we work with and the other stakeholders that are involved in this whole area. But it's a good question and it's one that we just spent three days hashing out and we probably you know, got down the path 25% of the way and now we have framework to flesh out the other 75% so that I could probably give you eventually a piece of paper and you'll start to see what this means, tick off things. But the short answer is it's a dedication of resources and it's a commitment on our part to make sure that we're providing everything that we possibly can in a format that you can use. Great. So that's the that's the really the short answer. The anatomy of the activation that, that, that is behind that is still a little influx. So yeah, Margaret, if you want to talk or do you want to take questions and then Well I don't mind actually I could just follow up on that as well. But yeah, yeah I really hi I'm Mario Har, I'm a project technical manager for with HOT. But basically yeah, going back to what Mikhail said this morning for uh, for phase two, we're basically going to kind of look a bit more at HOT and try to get them a bit more structured so that better communication so that we do know, you know, we're giving support to the activation team because it's the most important part of what we do. But not only for the activation coordinators, but also the volunteers that are doing all the mapping because without them, you know, our activations wouldn't really be going anywhere. So what we want, I mean, what I've been seeing a lot coming in with the Nepal activation that's currently going on. There's been a lot of trouble with new mappers that aren't getting this information on how to do the mapping and stuff like that. And so they're they're trying to validate squares that, you know, and they're not validating properly and it's making the whole process harder. And that's a whole part of like us getting bigger as an organization and trying to help with this crisis is we need to kind of systemize everything and make it easier for the coordinators but also the new mappers that are coming in. So that's what the curriculum and the sprint that we're doing is part of it. And to try and define what an activation is so that we're also communicating correctly with organizations and just making everything a lot easier. Like we wanna get more coordinators to come in, hopefully with the curriculum, train them, and then we'll be able to, uh, yeah, I mean, we'll be able to activate better and yeah, the whole process will be better, pretty much. Yeah. Also just need to, we need to share the workload. I mean, really, there's only uh, maybe a handful of people that kind of are, are coordinators that, re that really um, coordinate all the behind the scenes <coughs> stuff that HOT does. And, you know, it's time to really start onboarding more people. Uh, you know, I, I'm afraid that if, if we have two big events like this, it may break HOT. You know, I'm, I don't think so. But we're, we would be pushing our limits of what we could actually accomplish um, if we had two big events like this. We're pretty good at handling one. Uh, we need to start onboarding more people so that when that situation arises, we're not um, kind of crippling ourselves and, and be able to, to actually focus enough on both of them to, to provide the support that's required of, of a major disaster. So. I mean, at this point, unless anybody from the coordination side, and you guys are coordinators too, <laughs> you might have to be. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I'd like to just get, get, gather feedback, 
I can throw up some stuff from the sprint if people want to kind of see the, the really dirty work in process. Um, nothing's really kind of um, reviewable. It's like 20 some pages of just kind of raw material. Uh, if people want to look through it, that's fine. Otherwise, you know, I'd love to take suggestions and, and just make it an open conversation. Okay, what are you looking for? Do you, anybody want to hear what we just did when Nepal happened? Anybody want to hear how that process went? Okay. Yes. Okay. So, um, the morning that the earthquake struck, I woke up, and Pierre Blonde, one of our activation coordinators, was had already started a Skype channel. Skype is a big tool that gets used behind the scenes for coordination in, the, in these instances. So by the time I woke up a few hours after that had happened, somebody, Manning, one, one of our existing activation coordinators, Manning, I think has sent an email to our main hot email list. So anybody here who's on that main hot email list, you would have been immediately included in the process that we had started. And he sent an email to that list and said, there's been an earthquake in Nepal. And so that was the beginning. That's the starting. We haven't activated yet. We don't know if it's going to be an activation. We don't have any idea. But the first thing was our community, well outside of just activation coordinators, just voting members, the community that's interested in HOT was told that there's been an earthquake in Nepal. And once we knew that, because we're a volunteer organization and, you know, Open Street Map is founded on the principle of it's a duocracy, which means we don't have to vote on anything. You don't have to get approval. You can go to work right now. And yeah, in these early phases, we might duplicate some stuff because we're not exactly communicating. But the minute that email went out, everybody who was on that list started doing what it was that they knew how to do, the part that they could contribute. So Pierre, or no, not Pierre, um, JGC. I call him JGC. But the first thing that I saw when I woke up was I saw the email and I saw that JGC had created Jean a Gilet. Skype group. What's that? Jean Gilet. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Jean Gilet. Um, had created a Skype group to start coordinating. And he had pulled in, he's got a laundry list or a, he's got a list of contacts on his Skype that's as long as my arm and I'm not kidding. And so he knew that this was an earthquake which is different than a typhoon, which is different than you know a slowly rising flood. He knew that this was an earthquake. So he went through his list, and he's worked with these people for years. He went through his list, and he started checking boxes in his contact list, and he added them all to that communication room. And that was, you know, first thing, email. Second thing, people started doing whatever it was they knew how to do. And we created the Skype room to start doing coordination and it populated it with the initial group of people. And that initial group of people that it was populated with then go through their list of Skype contacts that's as long as there are, and they add in all the people that they know they're gonna need in this communication room for our coordination. So there was a communication room set up right away. Other people immediately just went on and started reviewing what the imagery looked like, what was available this moment for us to start tracing because the very next thing we're going to be concerned about are holes in our imagery. So one of these first steps was somebody got on Bing and just started, well, they used JASM, I'm sure, but they fired up JASM, they loaded the Bing layer and Mapbox layer, and they started looking to see where we had high-res imagery from before this event started. At the same time, they started evaluating. Now, this works a little bit differently because we were lucky to have Cap Andrew Living Labs as a partner with us in everything we do. So the other thing they started doing was they started looking to see what was already mapped in OpenStreetMap. Where did we have no data that there probably was going to be a problem? So we also had people who were scouring the sites to figure out, you know, like the USGS to start looking for the maps of where these aftershocks are happening too. And every time they're finding something that's useful, they're either sharing it on the hot email list so that everybody can see it and it can you know, tick in your mind, well, maybe I should go look here, or maybe uh, we could use somebody who can do, you know, I know a guy who does automated imagery analysis and he was working on landslides last time I talked to him. That might come into play here, so I'm gonna send that guy an email and see if he's interested in helping. 
So as people are finding these resources, they're sharing them with our organization. And at the same time, we're monitoring news sources. Um, you know, <coughs> it's not very likely, but in the unlikely event that this was a super small, I don't even think we had, I mean, maybe we had, maybe Manning had the, the magnitude. Manning's a disaster relief person in, I want to say, Philippines. Philippines. So maybe he had access to some of that data. Maybe there was a magnitude in there. But now we've got people scouring the news sources to try and figure out what's going to be the impact of this event. So that was going on. That started going on. The communication, the coordination channel is growing this whole time. We know that Skype can only handle 200 individuals in one communication group because we reach that limit when it comes trying to coordinate with all the other, all the other people. And so something happens where we don't want to keep a room full because we don't know who we're going to have to add. So now sometimes these coordination rooms start to split. We split off. We created an open street map and a cartography and imagery room. And so all the people who were primarily concerned with that left the major room so that there was room for more people to join. And then they went into the room that was more specific to what they were going to be contributing to this event. So as I would say, I don't, um, four hours, four or six hours. I would say after four or six hours, it was pretty apparent that one, we were gonna have something to contribute. We had all the work that Kathmandu Living Labs had, had done already in the Kathmandu Valley, and we had nothing in some of the other areas that were outside of that, uh, but still had you know yellow and red circles on them on the USGS website. So it looked like we already had something to contribute, so we were gonna make sure that we communicated what existed right now to our partners. And we knew that we were gonna to have to create more stuff. So I would say it was like four or six hours, well before that, somebody had sent the email that said, do we activate? Now, we can be asked to activate. Incidents can happen and a partner can say, you know, the maps are just not good enough here. We just don't have it. We're gonna ask you to activate. Could you fix our map problem? And that plays a big role in it, you know, that we need to look and make sure we can map them. Maybe we have no imagery, maybe we can't get imagery for it, but that plays a big role. We had already started the Should We Activate talk before anybody had requested us to. Now, we've been talking with our partners because they were in the coordination channel, so, <clears throat> so even without a formal request, we had a pretty good idea that we were probably going to be involved. So before the four or six hour mark, we had already, somebody had already sent an email are we going to activate with a question mark? And I think once we started hearing casualty reports, even though they're pre preliminary, and you, <clears throat> and you can get casualty reports that turn out to get revised downward, these were always getting revised upward. And so I think it was right about then and there that you know, Pierre Milan said, yeah, I think we should activate. And so as soon as Pierre Milan said that, the first thing we did was we identified leaders. And it's a duocracy. So at this point in time, identifying leaders meant Pierre Milan said, okay, I've been working on this for four hours already. I already know all the people in the room and I've already been reviewing the imagery and we've been talking to the people at Digital Globe or whoever, whoever else. So Pierre Milan was an activation coordinator for this. Um, we started trying to get in touch with NAMA in, in Kathmandu and we couldn't get in touch with NAMA to find out if they were okay. Um, so that didn't happen. But Manning stepped up and started doing activation coordination. Uh, I think JGC started working on imagery, started finding out what we could get. Everybody calls it JGC. <laughs> Everybody calls it JGC. We started, um, he started figuring out where we could get imagery from, who was going to be taking pictures of this post event, and you know, then it was just full on, and it basically hasn't stopped since. And all that it's done is grown. So as we find out more needs and get reports back from Cat Andrew Living Labs and NAMA and the people that he works with, that just informs, oh, I'm sorry, tasking manager job was set up. It was decided that we're going to go simple, let's do roads. You know, logistics are key in responding to these crises. So we can map buildings all day long, but 
what they're going to want first is a roadmap so that they know how to get around. You know, it was mentioned that, hey, this, so now we start talking about the, the, the nature of this particular activation. Okay, this is Nepal, it's mountainous, there's very few roads out to different places, there are dams and lakes that could be affected by this, which means we might need to start evacuations because if the dams were damaged. So now we started hearing all the things that were very specific to this activation. And HOT, in the coordination channels, starts creating more tasking manager jobs. And so we did, base, we did road base mapping first. We started hearing what else. Now we need to know open fields because in an earthquake situation, nobody sleeps indoors. Nobody sleeps indoors. So we knew if we could identify open fields, those were likely to turn into ad hoc internally displaced persons camps. So they told us, look, we're gonna to need to know open fields because they're either gonna be IDP camps or they're gonna be helicopter landing zones. They told us, you know, there's a lot of bridges because of this mountainous territory. So we'd like to know if you can do it. And there's some stuff we can and can't do. We had a hard time with finding radio towers in Vanuatu after the hurricane. That's those are tough to map from aerial imagery. It can be done, but it takes a lot of detailed looking. Can we, you know, so they said we need bridges, dams. We need to know where these dams are. If you can see the dams, we already have a lot of this mapped, luckily, because it's the kind of stuff that somebody will go and map. This is a bridge, this is a dam, just because they like mapping that kind of stuff. So luckily we already had a decent inventory of those things, but it got added to our list of things that we needed to pay attention to. So then we kind of kicked into the phase of the activation that repeats, you know, and this is where we're creating tasking manager jobs. Their purpose is getting served. We're getting more feedback on where they need the maps, where they think that the damage is gonna be or the people are gonna be. And so this process just repeats. The middle phase of these activations is kind of a cycle. And, yes sir? So when you say they, do you mean the people in Nepal? Or? Yes, primarily Nama in, um, I mean, NAMA has a team, but NAMA is the person, eventually, yeah, that's true. So, you know, sometime the next day, NAMA got into the actual offices of, of Kathmandu Living Labs. They, <clears throat> you know, checked on his team to make sure everybody was okay. And then they set up a situation room there so they could start to figure out what they needed to do to, you know, make sure their people were safe but also what they needed to do to be able to inform us. So the boundaries that you define of what needs to be mapped, that just came directly from the hot activation numbers without consulting with anybody on the field, or just from your intuition of what areas might be affected? Uh, it was mostly yeah. like reports will come in, you know, that these villages they haven't heard from, or there's reports of massive damage. So we would kind of build it off of the but, reports. But not the initial phase. The initial phase we were looking at circles on the USGS quake map, you know, so that I could see approximately where the cluster of the initial quake was epicentered. You know, we're kind of going that this is gonna be some of the centers of where this is a real problem. And then all the aftershocks, you can see the pattern of the aftershocks. So yeah, I mean, before we're in communication with local people on the ground, we had a task manager job up. Because we could also see where we had a deficiency and figure that we're gonna to need to fill this in. Yes, sir. And, and how much time uh, before you get updated imagery for this area? How long was it before we started getting imagery? Unfortunately, I was in the process of planning an activation, the activation spring thing that Russ talked about and the summit. So I wasn't as heavily involved as possible. But it was within a day or two, but it was cloudy because it's monsoon season. So we got imagery pretty fast. The partners that we work with are pretty good because they're all being asked to produce this data. It's not just us who's asking them. You know, the Army's asking them, the government's asking them. It's not a secret that they're being asked for it, but as I recall, the first set of images we got were cloud covered. There's also pre-event imagery, yeah. which Tom and Matt and oh, Fox uh, filled in. Yeah. Yeah, like I, there were gaps in the, pre, in the big imagery. Oh, very interesting. I'm sorry, I wasn't. There is two kinds of job in two kinds of imagery, pre-disaster, post-disaster. So the pre-disaster imagery was readily available and you can trace all the roads, all the baseline map, yeah. from scratch uh, at the beginning uh, 
of the event and the activation. And then it's getting more difficult after that when you want to localize uh, count uh, of uh, displaced persons and so on. You need really good and new imagery. That's tricky. But uh, for the pre-disaster imagery, it's and not so hard. You know, well, it's kind of hard because there's a yeah. lot of it. And at some point, I can't remember when Digital Globe opened up all of their archives and all. And then I think some point later, that access fell over because it was oversubscribed. So like, <laughs> you know, the map kid was like, at, was like asked to do some stuff. And I think there were two images that were produced. Mapbox was also working on it. Then, oh wait, did you look? Google's doing something. There's a lot of like fast moving um, availability, not availability, even of the, of the pre-disaster imagery. And I still think we have this trouble of like, there's just so much of it and all of it possibly could be useful, but we only have so much ability to um, process it. Yeah, yeah, because we get it in different, well, we don't get it, but it becomes available in different formats. And for us to make it available for people to map from, it has to go through a fair amount of processing and then tiled and then put on a tile server. And so, you know, the raw imagery takes some dealing with, but we do start before we talk to anybody on the ground. And I can't speak to, all activations, but my guess is that we talk to somebody on the ground a lot sooner during this activation than we have in some other activations because Cap and Dubin already worked with us and they already had people out on bikes going as far as they could to see what they could do, you know, to get a sense of where these damages were. And since then, luckily, Cap and Living Labs has hooked up with, you know, the, um, the um, you know, the Army and the other agencies that are there, so that now they can sort of be a, a center for all this information to come into and then pass it to us for needs. That's a lot easier versus all the needs coming directly into us to figure out. Although they come into us too, separate from Kathmandu Living Labs, because not everybody knows about Kathmandu Living Labs. Um, but yeah, we started before we had talked to anybody on the ground, and that's pretty typical. Like, real, real quick, we'll take more questions. I'm going to say we're already cutting into your lunch quite a bit. So 50 minutes for lunch. I, I'm willing to stick around, but maybe we can also do a birds of feather on activation if, if people are interested, or maybe like tomorrow during lunch or something, so we have more time. Yeah, so it's, what do we have, five minutes until it's quarter after, until it's quarter after? I think that's about right. Yeah, that's about right. So, Okay. Yeah, so we're in the middle phase of the activation right now. We're in the part that repeats. We clearly activated. We're in this cycle of map, feedback, map, feedback, acquire new imagery, uh, get requests for what they want out of us, talk to the, the agencies that are using the data products that we produce to find out can they use them, can they not use them. I didn't hear back. I was on a co coordination call earlier in the week, and I had to follow up with that. But you know, we oftentimes get, I can't, you know, the, we, we got a strong call for the fact that the government was not able to use the data that was being produced. And it wasn't just our data that they weren't able to use, it was some of the imagery data, you know, because I was on an imagery coordination call and the government felt like it wasn't, it's not just HOT that has this growth problem, there's other parts of the whole emergency, digital humanitarian network emergency response process that is also going through a little bit of a growth phase as we, you know, because these products didn't exist before. So, I mean, they have existed for a long time, but in the immediacy and the number of people who are providing them and that sort of stuff has increased. The value of them has been, how, how much people appreciate their value has been increasing. So the demand has been increasing. So. The, the whole sector has some growth and coordination issues to work out too. It's not it's not just us, that's for sure. We'll take that question or it was just it was just a comment really on the uh, that's fine. Yeah. It was just a comment on the um, the value of the data from a map action point of view. Um, we've got three guys in the field in Nepal at the moment. And looking at the map catalogue, I would say that probably 95% of all the maps that we produce have got OSM data in them. Um, so much so that map actions internal processes are now taking account of processing of OSM data. So we 
have developed tools to create change only updates to send to the field. Um, so it's becoming incredibly valuable to us. Um, and so I guess what would be useful from our point of view is to formalise, as you've suggested you're, you're looking to do, or even semi-formalise the process of how to <coughs> feedback from the field to an activation coordinator so that we can help inform the priority of tasks. Um, and that's, that's, from our perspective, that's what we, we need to do here today. Yeah, I, we should share it so and we'll follow up. You know, of course, this the curriculum in the process um, probably several months out before we have really anything drafted, uh, but we'll, we'll hopefully we'll get there pretty quick. <laughs> uh, I have three, two, three things to. She's going to need the microphone. Please worry my mind. Um, the first thing was uh, for activation. Uh, how can we include the local community in in our activation process? It's just an open open question uh, because I see the importance of Kathmandu Living Lab now on the ground. How can we uh, include them in the whole process? Um, and linked with it also, uh, how can we prepare for a crisis uh, for an activation? Because also in this uh, crisis, we knew there was a an earthquake co coming, we knew there is a there was a, a big earthquake coming, so can we prepare already some things for, for a crisis like this? Uh, also linked with the local community, I think, they know that their environment, so I think maybe we can also yeah, think about this. And then the last thing is, uh, we also should do a, an evaluation of uh, our activation and I think this is very, very important to do to, to improve our uh, activation process. Uh, that's one thing that's hugely lacking. You know, yeah. we, we, we do a really good job to map, and then we kind of, we're like, ooh, that was yeah. tough. Yeah, we yeah. walk away. But we, yeah, we really need to start doing some after action review kind of the reporting documentation yeah. stuff. And you know, Yuriki, I would say to your first point, to your first two points, to her first two points about involving local people, I don't have the answer, but a beautiful model of it is Kathmandu Living Labs. That's why they exist. They exist because, um, I'm terrible with the names of organizations, but organizations like the World Bank identified that these were involved, that this is gonna be earthquake prone and we wanna get local mappers and we wanna get them to build some resilience, not just mappers, uh, Kathmandu Living Labs is about technology to empower people, and it's not just mapping technology, but that's a big part of it. But the count. Well, the one thing to note about Kathmandu Living Lab is that it has really strong leadership. That Nama is uh, not only very learned and has a, a PhD in, in this very topic, um, but he has like the vision and leadership to do so. Um, and identifying people like that and growing together. It's not the only model, but it's pretty key. Yeah, yeah. I, I think also the curriculum development. We're going to do pilot workshops in countries like somewhere in Africa, perhaps Southeast Asia, to train coordinators that will be more on the ground so that when we do have an activation, we'll be able to work with them. It would be great to include the data. Yeah, so that's one of the plans too. Yeah, because it's because it's been a huge, it's been an amazing benefit. So Kathmandu Living Labs is part of the answer to that, but yeah. not the whole answer. And by the way, you know Kathmandu Living Labs is, um, you know, they're self-funding at this point, but they're short on resources, and so they are gladly accepting donations, which I believe are linked to off of our off of our hot page. So if you want to support a local grassroots group that's building local capacities and involving local people and right now saving literally saving lives you know you can know that the work that Andrew living labs does matters yeah. if you want to. yeah and to answer your final question with the evaluations of our activation i mean having the curriculum once it's in place after every activation will be reviewed so that we can adapt it and that the whole fall that is going to be part of the curriculum yeah, part of <laughs> yeah. clear edited uh, just a comment. Having oh, <laughs> <laughs> been on the ground in DRC for some years, I had the chance to coordinate some activations from Kinshasa, where most 
in an Italian organization and got their offices, which means that when an activation was starting, even if there was smaller size than this uh, actual one, um, I had the chance to go and talk directly with the humanitarian organizations and to see what were the needs. And they were the ones, I mean, we were doing those kind of meetings and discussions on prioritizing their, the areas and the objects to be traced. And uh, like just uh, one, two weeks ago, I had the chance to meet again with NSF regarding the Ebola uh, crisis in DRC, which happened to be last year. And, uh, and we debriefed and I got feedbacks about what had been useful for them, which data they actually used, which data was not useful and could have been like avoided. And, uh, and, and, and then I eventually got their field data that they had been collecting on the ground during that time. Because actually during the activation, it was very difficult to have people just sending me back the data. Just a few ones of them did it. But with MSF, I mean, there was so much, <laughs> they had so much work that I got it only recently and now I'm editing it. But in HOP with we still don't have a proper place to share this debriefing, lessons learned and all this. And actually, maybe some of the information, I don't know if everything should be placed public on the website or not. Maybe there should be some rephrasing a bit, but we should definitely have a better way to share this and to learn from it for the next activation. So I think it's also quite important that we have this curriculum and and the ability to have more people on the ground doing it, even if volunteering for this is quite a lot of work. So we can see even remotely. Perfect. Thanks very much. Okay, so okay. Yeah, we, we should wrap it up. Well, we'll oh, I'm sorry. Right? Yeah. Uh, oh. Just a very short one. So we heard, thank you. So we, we heard a lot about the, the, the field work side and, and the discovery and coordination. I'm also interested in the, the, the other side of uh, the activity, which is uh, remote volunteers and remote mappers. What extent can you anticipate uh, how many people you can uh, activate? How, how do you know how you can best promote? And then these kind of questions. Yeah, well, we see problems with that all the time. Uh, you know, the, the less gory the incident is, the harder it is to keep the motivation up. So, um, you know, it, it, part of that whole coordinator role will be some of that sort of promotion and, you know, talking to the press and, you know, every incident's unique. So, it, depending on what the situation is and, and sort of, you know, if the, the major media is doing our job for us, then we don't really need to worry about it. But uh, the smaller crises, we often, they kind of get forgotten. And it, it, it actually, to me, it, it's a lot of the coordinator's role. That's, you know, that's part of the job is if you're not getting the volunteer mappers, you need to do something, blog posts, Facebook yeah, posts, in, you know. I mean, that's, it, I mean, it, Russ brings up two good points that are, you know, Media coverage makes a huge difference, you know what I mean? And it's a two-edged sword, you know, if we're on CNN, it's, you know, we need to have somebody who's watching the servers because it's gonna be super busy. Um, but media coverage gets the word out, but like, um, forgive me for not remembering yesterday who gave us the figure, 30, 38,000 people need to die in a flood before it gets the coverage of one person dying in an earthquake. So you can't rely on the media. In this particular activation, and it's something that we're working on. Within, you know, once we had basically looked like this, we were gonna activate, you know, we were right on social media. And social media doesn't have the same reach that some of the traditional media has. It's, it's probably the same about now, but it's got immediacy. I didn't have to arrange an interview with anybody. I didn't have to wait for it to publish. I didn't have to wait for them to get the segment on. You know, and the way we're hoping that it works for us is that we share what's going on on our social media channels, and then everybody who likes our stuff shares it with their network, and we can get some quick reflection and build some numbers pretty fast. And I think, I recall in the activation channel, we were astounded how many people were already mapping. You know, we were creating tasks pretty fast, and some of them were 
you know, needed to be revised, but we figured we'll get it up there and we'll revise it and, you know, it'll be fine. And before we could get it revised, there's 15 people mapping on that and, you know, we didn't quite have the directions right. So it was pretty impressive this time how social media helped us. But you're right. I mean, it's hard for us to say right now if you asked me how many people can you activate. You know, I couldn't really say. I couldn't really say. I don't know what our core, you know, if we said we need help on something that wasn't in the news, how many people would come and do it? You know, I don't really know the answer to that question. And, you know, we should know the answer and be working on making that number always get bigger. All right, I think we'll do a hard stop now before yeah. we're out of lunchtime. Thanks. Two o'clock. Thanks.